So hello everyone and uh, welcome back. So uh, mm, next one is Metaba Analyst and uh, this is directly related to the lab in the afternoon. And uh, so uh, we already, last uh, module we discussed about statistics and uh, general strategies and the considerations in data analysis. And now we are going to introduce the Metaba Analyst which is uh, a tool uh, developed in the last 10 years, I, I started it in, yeah, about 10 years. So the our, our objective is uh, to be familiar with the standard metabolomics data analysis workflow and to be um, aware of the key elements of data integrity check, outlier det detection, quality control, normalization, scaling, and the, uh, there's a lot of question asked, but uh, here we will show how to do it with a metabolic analyst and how to use Metabolic 4.0 to facilitate data analysis. So uh, it, it is a, a Metabolic Analyst the current version 4.0, probably 5.0 is on the horizon. So uh, hopefully there's a lot of cool features going to be introduced. And, uh, and before we do a data analysis, we need to understand the goal. So uh, how the experiment was uh, con conducted. So at least we need to know there's a biological replicates and sometime, uh, especially during the initial um, initial step developing the technical platform, you need to do the technical replicates. So technical replicates help you to decide which metabolites you can measure reliably. So if you're doing technical replicates, you find things changes all the time, then clearly um, something is wrong. So either the platform is, uh, is not uh, good or um, certain compounds you are looking at is not uh, suitable for the platform. So metabolomics data analysis is two routes. So one is uh, targeted metabolomics and uh, basically also called quantitative me method. So you need to identify and quantify the compound before you're doing a downstream data statistical and a functional analysis. So, uh, so this part is a really, mm, uh, was quite time consuming and uh, now it's become more automatic. So with the, uh, with the quantity approach, you basically get a metabolite concentration tables and, um, and uh, you can do a lot of functional analysis because uh, once you have the ideal metabolites and a lot of pathways, you can assign them. And you also have some feelings about certain compounds, what's the functions. And uh, this is a, a advantage and uh, mm, for untargeted metabolomics, also a chemo matrix, also called, it called, it called global metabolomics. What they try to do is they're using all the features and um, don't identify them, just doing a statistical, statistical analysis. And they only identify later, found that the features are significant, the peak is significant. Then you try to identify them, only they are significant. So it try to save some time. Uh, so both uh, approaches are both popular. So uh, quantitative metabolomics is probably most uh, uh, commonest meta uh, NMR, uh, but for LCMS high resolution, so a lot of time is more doing untargeted, uh, just using this uh, picks first before you're doing a, a quantification. Why? It's because uh, a lot of things are unknown. If you try to insist everything to be identified, quantified, then it will be very uh, slow uh, to do it upfront. So the advantage of disadvantage compared this to is uh, uh, all the similarity here is that you need, all need to do a data quality check. So garbage in, garbage out always works. And uh, uh, for the, uh, for the mm, mm, chemical metrics or, or untargeted metabolomics, you need to do spectral alignment or binning. So yesterday we did that uh, LCMS spectra. We need to do the spectral alignment. We need to do the peak picking al alignment and uh, it's time consuming, okay? This one is uh, uh, definitely not manually. Uh, you need to use a good computer, good software tools. And uh, <clears throat> uh, if you do see the targeted me method, you need to do the common identification quantification if you're doing it manually. So it will take a while. So I did it when I, uh, uh, first year. So it takes about one month to get uh, about 100 samples uh, done properly. Uh, using genomics uh, at the time. Uh, after that, uh, when you do statistical analysis, it's more similar to in data normalization, uh, QC, 
and outlier removal if you detect it, and you do the PCA or PSDA. And uh, with targeted method, you basically you can do a more pathway analysis and write your paper because you don't you already ident you know uh, the ID at beginning and data analysis or functional analysis is easy. But for chemo uh, metrics of untargeted, you basically need to identify compounds. You cannot report a peaks uh, as a biomarkers and the right type of story. So somehow, um, if you want to publish in the journals at uh, talking about biology, you have to identify the compounds. So, so first step is data integrity and data quality. And uh, um, uh, this one is uh, uh, more uh, closely related to the, your machine, the platform. So you need to really calibrate your machine and make sure you have the blank, you have QC, uh, everything is um, is set up properly. So uh, this is your initial step and you have to build up platform. And uh, so here is NRMR is robust, but LC, GC, uh, and uh, it's better sample prep and the platform. So this, this protocol you need to be followed and need to be um, uh, followed uh, that well established protocols and uh, train the technicians uh, and uh, to make sure the reproducibility in the technical replicate is good and the, uh, uh, the compounds or, or the com regions of interest is being married reliably. So if you're doing our target in metabolomics, you can do a, a spectral alignment or in one go. For example, you have one, you're collecting one spectra after spectra after you get 100 or one, 100 ish, you can align them all together and doing the processing. If you're doing a thousand spectra, and so far I said, oh, we run into problem is uh, uh, even you use XMS, MD mine or something. If you have run a large scale sound of spectra, you just cannot com complete just because of memory. So uh, um, spectral uh, untargeted metabolomic is uh, fine if you're doing hundreds ish, but it's, when you go to sound level, it's uh, in theory, it is uh, doable, but uh, computational cost became uh, quite significant. And the tools, even including XMS, is not uh, able to deal with the tons of samples. So that's, uh, uh, that's the current issue. And I, I think a lot of re re researchers in this area realizing that. And so, um, but most of us won't be able to feel it because the hundreds of samples are pretty good and the tons of samples are quite rare. So, uh, uh, for NMR, uh, one common approach is uh, binging. So NMR, you basically uh, chop all this uh, um, uh, NMR spectra into uh, small beans. And uh, here it shows about uh, uh, 10 beans. So, um, so um, but, in, in, but the, air, the field usually have their preferred uh, width of the bean. For example, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, that's commonly used for NMR. You basically have the 12 ppm or divided by these beans, you can have about hundreds or thousands of the small beans. Each bean contains, sometimes bean will contain multiple features, sometimes contains no features. So you can see uh, from the example here. So you get the spectral alignment, spectral binging, and um, hopefully you, uh, the, the whole purpose is because you don't do target, uh, you don't identify quantify, you only use the features. You all, always want to make sure you're comparing apple to apple, orange to orange. So you want to uh, do an spectral alignment of being, you make sure it's being aligned properly. So after that, the next one is normalization. Mm, for example, here is, uh, are they different or same? And actually the, the I believe this is a urine sample, and if you do a normalization, and uh, and it will will become almost identical. So normalization is better for the uh, urine. It's not like a blood; it's a more, more well controlled. So it's a, a dilution effect or something else need to be incorporated. So um, so this this is a, this uh, effect is well known. For example, probability quotient, the method, the internal standard, and sample specific like weight, volume of, of samples is all well supported in the metabolist. So all this method is uh, been added because uh, uh, the community really responding to uh, different uh, also developing new approaches. A lot of things are working well, so it will be 
uh, incorporate metabolism. And uh, so, um, again, it's uh, depending your particular samples or protocols, you, you can choose the appropriate method. And the data scaling uh, can be uh, applied to samples or features. And uh, so scaling features help manage outlier. So uh, samples, for example, you have mm, choose the overall um, uh, the log and auto scaling, Pareto scaling, probability quotient scaling, range scaling. So this ones are quite all of them commonly used and been well discussed. So for example, the the paper I mentioned about the analytic damage 2006 have a, one of the most comprehensive uh, analysis on them. So I don't recall any subsequent uh, study on that topic and being as thorough. So that one's pretty sealed the deal. So it's very well discussed about the advantage disadvantage. So I encourage you to read it. So if you want to spend more time, but uh, uh, again, summary is that uh, all of the methods have their advantage and disadvantage. So um, it's very hard to come up with one single solution. It's always working well. So that's why MetaVanalyst contains a lot of the um, options for you to choose from. <clears throat> So now we're talking about the QC outlier and uh, data reduction. So uh, one thing is that people are always eager to remove the things that seems not to uh, uh, follow their uh, their expectation. So uh, here is that uh, outlier removal need uh, justification. First, the sample collection, sample measurement is takes time, take, it costs a lot. You don't want to easily just remove them. And sometimes it actually indicates something very novel. So don't do it uh, uh, too early and too eager. So um, the, the other one is that um, how uh, um, this is called data filtering. You want to remove. Uh, so again, is that um, data filtering is uh, data filtering can be used on both feature level. Uh, uh, so we will discuss later. So some features looks like uh, close to background noise. And uh, some features is a clear, very good signal and a beautiful signal, well mirrored, but it's that's not a change. So it does not change, does not um, consist of bell markers or related to your biological process. So things that uh, uh, it's not contain too much information. And uh, so you, you, you can think about to remove them. So in uh, uh, transcriptomics or RNA-seq called microarray, uh, and there, there's a tradition. Usually, you can remove almost 25% of all the genes uh, that, based on their either even either abundance or variation, and uh, and almost uh, always improve the downstream. So uh, this is we're talking about the comprehensive uh, transcriptome or global metabolomics, which contains a lot of this uh, noise. So for target uh, metabolomics, usually this this is uh, you can uh, skip this because you manually go through that, only have about hundreds of the metabolites. So you should keep them as much as possible. So the other one is uh, um, dimension reduction, feature selection also can help you um, uh, deal with these uh, issues, and uh, we will discuss later. And so uh, <clears throat> let's go. Uh, uh, I think it's directly to MetaBalance. So it is um, comprehensive web-based tools for uh, statistical functional analysis of metabolomic data. And now we have uh, uh, spectral analysis uh, added uh, just uh, before the workshop. We also have um, actually multi-omics with networks. So, uh, so that's, that's um, uh, a lot more things uh, published. So it is uh, first published in 2009. So it started developing in 2008. So, um, so it's the, at the beginning, the first version is doing uh, just a univariate, multivariate statistical analysis focused on stats. Uh, why is that? Uh, at the moment, the only thing you can do is either using uh, that uh, same kind, which is commercial tools. I, I, I don't, it's probably, uh, yeah, thousands of dollars to get a license. Oh, you're using Excel uh, to do the data analysis. Oh, you, if you use R, you can do some R based. But at the time, the R is not that popular. So uh, I, I found it's a very, uh, at least uh, time consuming for me to manually do it every time, write my R code, even I'm 
company with R. So I think uh, let's let's put it online so people can use it online, do their own data analysis. So I can have more time to do my own stuff. So that's the uh, main motivation. So I put our all the popular common statistics online. So uh, it, it it turned out to be quite useful, and people asked to add more things. So in 2012, we published two version two, and uh, one thing is the one ad addition is both focus on more functions. So uh, metabolite set enrichment analysis and pathway analysis, and uh, which is, uh, so you can see the version one or two mainly on targeted metabolomics. So we use univariate to focus on the functions. So, uh, so after that is uh, version three is published in 2015. <laughs> the main thing is that uh, is, uh, we realized that uh, a lot of people are using it. I, I also, we learned that some people actually also use it for microarray gene expression. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised to see why they don't do their own. They should have a lot of tools developed for themselves, but it turned out they, they said that metabolites are actually doing much uh, more intuitive, everything looks better. So it turned out, but it's also caused a big burden to the server. So we need everything to be better. So uh, we published version three is basically redesign the whole interface and make it a faster memory, uh, cause less memory. And we also added a biomarker analysis, which turned out to be, a, um, to be also an interesting uh, discovery because biomarker, it seems everybody discussed it for about 20 years and there should be tools for that, but they turned out now. So we just do some biomarker analysis. Everybody will think, oh, that's so useful. They want to use it if uh, there's bugs and people will send me emails until, uh, keep sending me email until it's been fixed. So I know it's, uh, it's actually uh, quite uh, useful. And uh, so also feel honored to, to, to keep developing and sustain it. So we added that and uh, um, uh, throughout the years and we keep uh, improving the tools. So we have, so with the more user use it and a, a big concern is that, uh, because you update your tools, now I cannot reproduce my result. I said, what did you do? And they don't get, they don't remember it. So, um, uh, so we gradually introduce more uh, uh, reproducible research. Uh, so we exposed the R command. Why is because after 10, 10 years and people, the R became popular. A lot of people actually confident with R. They see R command, they don't feel scared. So uh, I found this very good educational uh, tools to let them see this is a command and this is a graph, this is statistics. And they see it online, they learn it. And uh, eventually I, I hope they will don't use web, they use the R package, uh, so reduce the server burden. So. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also a cloud. Uh, so version since version three, the uh, we use start using Google Cloud. So cloud actually became very useful, um, also easy to manage, and uh, we also added a lot of support. So since uh, version three, we started moving more towards untargeted metabolomics. Why is because uh, untargeted metabolomics became more and more uh, uh, LCMS based. It uh, became more play a big role in uh, like microbiome, like uh, environmental exposome, like uh, a lot of studies. So we study adding more. So in, in version four, we study introduce something else called the uh, MS peaks to pathways. So you don't have to identify them. You just use peaks and you can get to pathways. Also meta-analysis, network-based data integration. So, uh, uh, so there's a lot of the evolution uh, behind the scenes and it is a basically based on the whole community. You, what is the, what the user or the community works and uh, basically a metabolite responding to that. Uh, sometimes leading, sometimes uh, uh, just uh, following and that. So it's very responsive. So uh, we usually have uh, at least one or two updates per month. So that's a lot of work because the tool is so used so much. We want to make sure it's not introduce new bugs and make sure the performance as good as before and uh, before we uh, get any more. So this is overall workflow and uh, you have a lot of different input. So uh, tables and pick list and uh, we can add in spec chores because we just added, added support yesterday. Uh, the, yeah, the, yes, two days ago. So we also support a raw spec now. After you upload, you need to do data processing. 
And so the whole idea is to make sure you from your raw data and to uh, normalize the table. So this normalized table can be used for statistical analysis, pathway analysis, power analysis, biomarker analysis. And so, uh, so this concept is overlap with our omics analysis in a nutshell. So you need to uh, know which step you are currently in. So, so overall is that the disregarding how, how, how many fancy uh, interface the online call remains the same thing. It's pre data pre-processing, especially it's important for the raw structure. And after that, you do the data normalization. Also, uh, uh, if you're doing a really, really large scale studies, you should do batch effect correction. Batch effect the correction somehow is here. Other utilities, you do a batch effect. So um, correction. So after you do, after you, everything is a, normalized and no batch effect, you can do a data analysis and data interpretation. So this is a common approach. And so here is that um, we provide a lot of example data set and uh, you, you can download them from, if you click data formats, you will see a lot of data set. But on it, so you can uh, download the upload, but on the other hand, you can also directly go uh, click a start analysis and uh, because we have the example there directly below your uh, upload page so you can also do, do that don't have to upload so it is uh, um, used for for the um, screenshot in the uh, next uh, few slides uh, we will use this sample it's called the compound concentration data uh, collected from Carl Ruman it's from four groups and uh, let me see so it, it uh, feeds a different uh, uh, diet. So uh, have different proportion of the grain. So from zero, five, 15 or 45%. So the hypothesis is that if you really have a very high concentration of the grain inside the diet, it actually damages the cow rumen. So you're going to see some uh, changes in the metabolomics. So this is a, a collaboration uh, 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 between the David and uh, uh, one professor in the agricultural department. So uh, we use this um, data during data processing. So um, common task is uh, uh, convert the raw data to a data matrix suitable for study analysis. And here we uh, have several common format. Uh, the one we will uh, this demonstration is a concentration table. It is from target metabolomics. So uh, I would like to pay, put your attention to here is uh, the last uh, um, um, three actually become also common. Everybody knows the first one, but actually pick list. If you uh, collect a pick, uh, a pick picks from your uh, spectra, each uh, sample is one file. You, you have 100 files, basically 100 pick list, M, Z, Z on the retention time. You can upload as a one, uh, zip files and metabolites will align the peaks and do the analysis, okay? And you can, of course, you can upload the raw spectra, basically raw spectra, uh, well, we will do the peak picking, peak alignment. And uh, if you pick peaks, so the peak peaks uh, will much smaller. So I'm saying if you have more than 100 spectra, what you can do is you pick your own peaks. Uh, so uh, if you have less than 100 spectra, you can upload. Spectral being is uh, also you can do it for, um, for, um, uh, MR spectra. So raw spectra, temporary are disabled on the public server. This is uh, um, public, but uh, uh, we are using the dev server. So dev server is powerful. We will do more testing and uh, probably by the end of the uh, week, we will make it to the open to the public. So uh, this spectral analysis will going to be um, available um, to public soon. So with this uh, uh, example data we downloaded, which is uh, four groups from Carl Ruman targeted uh, metabolomics. So we use statistical analysis, this module. This one is the most popular one. And uh, the other one is also popular, but it's uh, usually, even you're doing biomarker and other things, you should try from statistical analysis. Why is because it gives you an overview of your data. So it's a lot of the things quite, a, quite a, uh, useful. So uh, what your data, Format is so you tell them it is concentration and it was samples in a rows. So if your sample is saved in the transformed format, you put the samples in the columns. So you can see there's other options, spectral beans and picking in the table is from untargeted approach. 
you can see below, we also recently added MZ table 2.0M, uh, which is designed for metabolomics. So I'm not sure how many of you actually is using it. This is a kind of the, the community in metabolomics want to uh, uh, promote this approach. So we added there, but we also have doubt whether people are actually using this, but we just put it here recently based on the, 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 uh, the just be a good citizen for the uh, community uh, recommendation, but uh, we will see whether it's useful. So the other one is a compressed file. Here is that you can uh, collect your peak list, one peak list file per sample, and uh, and uh, then you can upload and doing that. So this is um, so you as I mentioned, you don't have to download and upload. You can directly select here and uh, and uh, so you save some bandwidth and direct click next and to go to uh, the submit page. So this data set is, uh, it contains a serial grain, have a different concentration. So uh, it is analyzed with NMR spectroscopy using, uh, uh, using quantum metabolomics techniques. So it uh, should be from genomics uh, quantification tools. So the hypothesis, the high grain diet uh, at stressful on cows. So, uh, so if we click uh, uh, data collection, uh, data, click uh, submit and uh, you will get this next page called the data integrity check. So what this page does is just make sure your data is uh, suitable for the next few steps. This step actually very frustrating for um, a lot of users, also frustrating for us to make sure um, the exceptions are handled and make sure that if there's errors are communicated back to the users, we cannot, um, uh, when users use metabolites, we have no idea who they are, uh, where is data, what are the data, because every day there's about uh, uh, 3,000 users. So, and uh, they come and analyze the data, they download and the data will be removed. So, and, and uh, so we have no idea. And the best way is they take care of themselves. So we have to develop the tools that more, more or less uh, let them help themselves. So how to do that actually is uh, very hard. So we, we have to try, and it's done working well and people complain, we, we try to understand why they will improve. So back in the forest, we getting more stable uh, uh, things. I also think user probably learning towards much, uh, uh, learning towards understand what better. So they start in adopting the practice. So either way, if you click the example data and you are going to this page and basically you have checking the data passed and so it's a fail that you're going to have some red lines. So some uh, basically emphasize what it think could be the cause of errors. Most time it's quite meaningful. Sometimes it's not. So uh, that's, that's we receive the emails and we need to look at data and tell them what could be wrong. Sometimes we find it's a common issue. We have to improve the code to make it uh, uh, less dependent on the user interact, uh, the interaction. So you can see here is a missing value estimation. And here is that uh, a total of zero missing value was detected. So it's not applicable. And uh, uh, so if you really have a lot of missing value, you want to do it, you need to click this. But if you click skip, even there's missing value, see it will say that by default, this value will be replaced by that small value, which small value is the lowest the positive value divided by five. So it will be as a baseline uh, value and to replace. So this page, we show some normalization. You already see this uh, page uh, before, and uh, you, you can see so many uh, um, options. And here is a sample normalization. Sample normalization is based on biology, based on uh, experiment. So if you collecting from different uh, tissue samples or volumes uh, of liquid volume, you shouldn't use that sample specific normalization like a weight of volume. So you can need to click. So for this one, this is a cow rumen, and, uh, and uh, what we want to use is, we want to use a reference group. So if you, um, it's called normalization by a reference sample, it's also probability quotient normalization, which is well used for MR metabolomics. So what it does is try to use a sample and everything normalized against the sample. We 
what we has done for this one is we um, create a reference group. Basically, uh, we don't because some one selecting one sample uh, could be sub could be subjective. It's hard to reproduce, but we want to select an average. We want to create an average sample based on a reference group. So you have reference sample. For example, this one's uh, zero. Zero is a control. They have zero grain. So we have created an average group. A sample from this, then you apply the probability course of normalization against this average from this group. So this is more stable. And then you choose auto scaling, and uh, so uh, it should go to that. So don't I know some of you are asking question why you choose that? And <laughs> this is a uh, just for demonstration purpose. You can certainly choose the other one, but on the other hand, is uh, um, below here, they give you some uh, 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 visualization, allow you to see whether the data looks normalized or not. And uh, so a lot of times based on your experimental design, based on the practice of this particular uh, people usually applied. So you need to follow the standard before you try something that's not. So auto scaling, which is mean standard divided by the standard deviation is very common. Log scaling very common. And this one is also common. So far that we don't want to apply too much. So uh, we want to do minimal. Uh, so if you apply too many normalization, it's make it a, a, the scaling or even any result is hard to interpret. So what I'm saying is, that, um, if only if your sample have some biological uh, very reverence, so you should try to adjust it here. So biological, like uh, this is very important. Statistical adjustment is more or less it here. So transformation log is common and all the scaling is common. So we try to use common ones because everybody understands these common ones first. So um, this one is, uh, uh, we already mentioned about this and uh, we talked about the row wise, column wise. So row wise and column wise, it became sample wise and uh, uh, feature wise. So this one, uh, uh, this one is, uh, um, uh, Based on that paper, we also added several of other uh, procedures. So, uh, so here's a visualization. You can see before and after. Um, so before you can clearly see it's uh, skewed to the left. You can see a lot of concentration actually very low. And this is very typical to metabolomics. And some of them is very high. And uh, I'm pretty sure what's this one? And a very high one, probably acetate. So this one is very high here. So. Um, Mm, if you do the normalization as uh, uh, we've selected, you can see it's became much more normal, looks normal. Mm. So the thing is that you cannot get absolute, but uh, clearly that's uh, that's already quite symmetrical. And um, uh, so uh, the here is that you don't know what uh, the best normalization will be. So you can try an error and also follow uh, the things you can understand. So after normalization, and uh, it's good to um, uh, see whether there's outliers and, and something suspicious. And uh, so how do you get that is um, uh, you need a lot of experience, of course. The other one is um, visualization. Something is totally standing out and you want to see whether it's normal or not. Uh, so uh, uh, how to deal with outlier is visual inspection and uh, normalization and exclusion. So. Uh, you all you you need you need do it with caution. So, but you need if it's uh, you suspect it, you need to start thinking about it. Can you address it by normalization? Because every sample actually precious. So you try to um, try to see if you can correct it first. And uh, <clears throat> this is talking about the samples. If we talk about noise reduction set, we talk about the um, features. Features mainly for untargeted because the noise is very uh, big uh, for untargeted metabolomics, be it as MMR spectra beans or um, LCMS uh, pigs. So uh, people want to include everything in the analysis, don't want to filter the sample, which uh, I, I found out uh, mm, is somehow is understandable, but a lot of time is uh, if you don't do that, you are going to, you could have a big penalty later. Why if you include in this, uh, a noise, and uh, you actually reduce the power. Why is multiple testing adjustment? So if you test, if you have like say one thousand features, 
and uh, you're going to adjust for one thousand times. If you have five hundred features, you have five hundred times the huge difference. So the penalty is different. So usually, uh, also reduce the noise to help you um, not only p-value calculation. Also, there's a lot of other uh, signals being enhanced. Most likely, it's a, a low or low signal close to baseline. Usually, it's not accurate mirrored in a lot of platform. And so, if uh, in uh, transcriptomics, people studies that uh, the whole overall pattern and uh, just using top 15 percent of the signal that's the most abundant one it will always keep the same the pattern energy change almost so uh, you are talking about you reduce about 15 percent of the features that or genes that uh, just have low abundance but the biological story this pattern is down the chain so uh, so that's uh, what i'm seeing omics uh, analysis have a lot of features, but a lot of noise. So you don't, you want to abandon the ideas that uh, you want to include everything in the downstream analysis. So some pre earlier data filtering, uh, you will improve a lot of the downstream analysis. So this figure shows uh, what the outlier looks like, and this is created uh, artificially. So we just uh, randomly adding some big numbers to some samples. And uh, you can see in the left, you see it from PCA, it's a P080. This is sample totally standing out from the remaining. And um, definitely this is a big cause for concern because you can see the majority of the green one is actually there and this one standing out. So some things that could be wrong. And this is sample, but if you want to see a heat map, you can see this uh, same sample. Uh, um, also very strong, so the concentration is very, very high. And so it's clearly um, could be a dilution issue and uh, also could be something else. So you need to spend the time on understanding that. So if you can, norm can normalize to adjust it, that's good. If you can't, and you can exclude them. How do you exclude them? Uh, you can re-upload your sample with a sample remove, but on the other hand, you, you can do it with a metab analyst is using a speech called data edit. So there's edit samples, you just scroll down and find the samples and remove them. So <clears throat> let's remove the outlier samples and the feature removal is uh, how feature filtering. Uh, it's, it's also called data filtering. Basically uh, there's uh, studies and published um, in mm, PNAS or even Nature uh, Journal and early days, they talk about um, uh, omics data analysis. Uh, uh, the, you apply feature filtering, you really have a much better result and strongly urge people to consider this. So what's the noise features or uninformed features? So there are several characteristics. One is the uh, features very, very small values. So close to baseline, detect limit. So this is understandable. And the other one is a variable that near constant. So you can marry them very well and they're very abundant, but it doesn't change. So like housekeeping genes, they are not informative in terms of your biomarker analysis and stuff. And they are not going to be significant in the pathway analysis. So the last one is low repeatability. So this is only uh, applicable if you have a QC sample because QC is uh, mainly from uh, technical replicates. So they should uh, within like a 20% of the LCMS or 30% for GCMS. So if uh, the your QC samples uh, uh, of this one have a uh, large of the RSD values, then that means it's not, uh, it have a low repeatability. So it uh, should be re uh, excluded. So this is uh, some of the basic rules we want to exclude. And uh, usually we found it's very good. And so uh, uh, for, um, for, for untagging metabolomics, you don't want to really uh, include everything. So here's noise reduction or data filtering. So uh, you, you, you can choose a different uh, variances, uh, a low variance, low incentive, low repeatability. And uh, so if you choose now and somebody doing it, you have, it's basically only allow you to have let, uh, five, uh, 100 features. So this is usually sufficient. So if you have more than 5,000 features, so it will feel you are going to apply, disregard you choose or not. So it will choose that whatever low variance or low intensity. So this is, a, we found out uh, uh, this is uh, healthy for your 
for the server, also healthy for the data analysis. So if you don't like it, and uh, I think you can use Metabolist R and do keep everything. But the web server, we do have some constraint. I don't think this constraint is unreasonable. It's just uh, we found it. Uh, uh, some people want to include everything. It causes the server stressed, but not necessarily good for your own data. So this is something we adopted. So next step, we do statistical analysis. Um, so what's the common tasks? We do uh, important features. And uh, this is just like differential uh, gene expression analysis. Then we try to identify interesting patterns. So, uh, and uh, we want to test whether there's some difference between phenotypes and the classification and stuff. So how do we do that? We're starting with the single, a simple univariate uh, approach like ANOVA. Then we gradually move to uh, PCA, PUSDA, and classroom. So this one we already covered about uh, um, um, the um, uh, st statistical details behind. So, uh, so if we go to the statistical analysis, we will see um, there's uh, several uh, available links. So here the arrows show this one we are going to explore, but you can see there are several things else we we will not explore. So it's up to you to explore. Also something is grayed out, you cannot do it. Why is that uh, they don't applicable? So it's for example, orthogonal PSD only suitable for two groups. But um, this sample contains four groups, so it's not uh, directly useful. You can also exclude the groups using data edit. Once you have two groups and you come back, it will be enabled. So, so let's do ANOVA. ANOVA is uh, um, uh, try to identify which, try to identify those metabolites that are different between all groups. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's here. So ANOVA is uh, people commonly used, and we just do ANOVA. So what's the cutoff? The cutoff is um, mm, is um, 0 0.05 based on adjusted FDR. So here is a post hoc analysis. What does that mean? Post hoc analysis. So it means that uh, that um, for ANOVA, you see the significance. But you don't that, but you don't know which two are significantly different. So you know there's something different, but you don't know which of them are different. So basically, this post hoc analysis for further testing only for those that are significant, and do a pairwise t test. Then mm, I think it's called Fisher's LSD, and it then tell you the uh, which two are significant. So uh, here you can see this result is a, um, it's a interactive graphics. You see a, a significant is red and insignificant blue, and you can click and you can see the uh, figures. This figures, uh, we have enhanced the figures, so it will look slightly different, but it's better. So it's a, if you uh, click the uh, details, and so how do you get a detail? You can see there's a table uh, icon. You click it, you will get the details. So if you click details, you will see another table. So it's so far it's ANOVA and uh, on the left and you see the result. And uh, you click Euracil, which is one of them uh, sort of here. You can see Euracil, this is a, um, original concentration. This is normalized concentration. And I receive, I receive a lot of the question ask, hey, why the normalized things looks like that? Because a lot of clinicians only custom to the left side. Once you see the, uh, looks like that. They just uh, lost. They just don't know why it can be lower than zero. And uh, just uh, so this is something I sometimes I try to help. Sometimes I just give them a link on the normalization because uh, this this part is that uh, uh, we assume people will be comfortable and do normalization and box plot with box whisk plot. And uh, that's that's uh, good to learn. And, but on the other hand, uh, you can see on the below on the right uh, column, the rightmost column is a result from post hoc test. So it shows which two groups that are significantly different. For example, your ratio, you can see that uh, 15, 0, uh, 13, 0, 15, 45, 0. That means that uh, uh, 
uh, uh, first, uh, all the statistical analysis is based on the normalized data. So let's take a look at the right hand hand side of the figure. So everything on the control is low, uh, the control is red, which is low. The 15, 13, or 45 is high. So you can see everything against the, the control is changed. But they themselves in between, there's no much difference between 15 to 13, 13 to 15, or 15 to 45. This is what the postdoc test tell you. So it's simple, but it's very useful. A lot of people really like this. You can do ANOVA, you can also see uh, who's different from who. So they, uh, otherwise you get, you know the big thing, but you still not answer your question. You want to see that. So, so these uh, um, features help you get there. So we're not saying that's a novel, but it's really useful for a lot of people uh, just want to understand your data. So what's next? And uh, we can compare different compounds to see which one are most different or most similar between the two four groups. And uh, let's see, do that. What you people usually do is uh, doing a feature correlation. For example, uh, a common use is uh, um, uh, like uh, you can have the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient and across all the compounds and then they see who's highly correlated to each other will be together. Uh, so this is a heat map of the correlation table. And you can see that um, uh, uh, this heat map, uh, uh, for example, here on the bottom, uh, bottom right, you can see several uh, red squares, which means uh, uh, positively correlated much. So like acid 3PP isobutyrate, and uh, butyrate uh, and uh, I'd evaluate. So some of them, this, this, this group is a uh, um, compound. This probably have some, hopefully have some functional correlation. So this is positive correlation. You can see almost go to one. And there's also negative correlation. So uh, this figure is not interactive. Unfortunately, we may make you interact later, but you can, there's a correlation matrix. There's a p-value matrix. And people are ob obvious find out it's useful. They can regenerate the figures using other things. So here. So uh, some people want to publication uh, quality figure. So you need to have the higher resolution as PNG or PDF or SVG. And you can select uh, the um, BPI dot per inch. So you can see this, this icon for your generate figures. So you select the format, select the resolution, you click uh, submit, you will get a 300 BPI one. So um, we get the figures and uh, now we go to the um, next group is so we this approach called a pattern hunter. Pattern hunter is uh, uh, what, uh, because this is almost like time series, have a zero, 15, 13, five, or, uh, 13 or 45. So we want to see whether certain compounds have some patterns. For example, a linear increase with the uh, diet uh, grain concentration increase. Oh, increase at the beginning, then it decrease. Or decrease, then increase in the last. So some people do have some stories behind this. So they're usually looking for particular patterns. How to do that is that on the left of this part, you, of course, you can go to the original statistic overview, select the pattern hunter. But now, since you were on a correlation page, you just directly click left, pattern hunter. And you'll go to this page. And you basically want to do um, find the patterns. So the pattern here is that you, what the pattern you define is, so for example, you want to define pattern is one, two, three, four. This you are looking for linear increase, okay? If you're doing a three, four, three, two, one, you're looking for linear decrease. And if you're looking for one, three, three, two, so you're looking for increase in the middle and decrease in the beginning and the end. So it's always the, so for example, if you specify the pattern like that, you will see the um, uh, result looks like this. So um, uh, correlation uh, bars. So for example, if you say that by the bottom is positive correlation, it's a, it's a, a, a orange. Um, at the bottom it's a bluish, so it's negative correlation. So it's a, strong positive correlation and strong negative correlation at the end. So which, which is basically for you to develop your stories. And uh, um, now we let's from that uh, uh, more linear pattern analysis to 
um, multivariate like PCA and PSDA. So, um, so PCA we discussed about scores and loadings and uh, um, which is 2D, but for the web-based tools, we can do it in a 3D. And um, so 3D is uh, um, more interactive uh, here. So uh, this is PCA's uh, uh, score plot. And, uh, and uh, you can see this is default with uh, different groups uh, mm, uh, shows up with a group with the sample labels. And somehow people don't like sample labels. You can click on select and use or use grayscale colors. So this uh, PCA uh, figures have several options to allow people to have their own pref preferred uh, coloring. So, uh, um, so actually uh, while here is that if you click on the top left, there's a processing. And there's also, I think there's a, a image editor. So you can specify actually specify the colors. So the green, red, or uh, blue-ish. Uh, if you don't like it, you can also specify the color. So far, it's uh, and even the uh, even the uh, uh, symbols. How do you specify? You can also specify that. So, Metavanis then allow you to do it right here. But they do have a panel in the, under the processing and allow you to specify the colors and the symbols to do everything. So if you see the loading plot, it is more uh, interactive. So the interactive means you can click uh, dots. And uh, so what, what we are seeing that you see that uh, groups is uh, separated along this uh, diagonal from the top right to the bottom left. And if you see this same diagonal separation, you can see that uh, uh, this is top left, bottom right. And uh, you see the most, uh, you want to see the most uh, feature, important feature that drive the separation. So you, you click this uh, uh, dots on, at the end of this diagonal uh, line. So you will see uh, something like a top is 3 pp and probably uh, endotoxin stuff. You will find this, uh, the feature you identify from multivariate PCA will be similar to those you identified with uh, ANOVA. So this is uh, comforting. So that's what I'm suggesting about multiple evidence pointing out to the similar set of features. That's much more convincing. So a lot of time PCA tell you the same story as um, ANOVA, okay? And uh, sometimes it's different. You need to think about, hey, is that true or is that something um, else? So here is a synchronized 3D plot. Why is synchronized 3D plot is, uh, um, we mentioned about uh, you want to see the separation. You want to see the features that uh, contribute to the separation. So it must be on the same perspective. So same perspective is uh, you rotate this one and the other side have to rotate simultaneously. So uh, we, we, we add in function. So if you rotate one, the other one rotates. So you see this uh, at the moment is a separation from the groups. So on the same angle from the um, bottom uh, left to the top right, you, you say the same thing. So that they will have the, uh, facilitate you to discover the important features. And at the top, I have something said, save view for report. Well, uh, this is important is that uh, some of the statical figures like we show in the previous um, page, uh, especially here, it is generated on the server and sent to your browser, to your computer, okay? If you generate a report, we, we, we have a report generation, it will be the same because this figure generated on the server and sent to you, so we know it. But if you go to this, this view, this is generated on your browser, okay? Server has no idea what you're looking, how you're interacting, which angles, how you rotate. So uh, if you want to generate report, it won't be the same as what you see here. And uh, if you want to include in this is best angle you want to include in the uh, uh, report, you need to click the save view for report. And this current one will be like a, just like a snapshot, like we're taking a photo and on, your, on this image you're sent back, so you will get the same image. So this one is we found out, uh, we don't know uh, how you interact with the figure. If you want it, you have to explicit ask, we use this one, so. So PC is unsupervised and PSD is supervised. We already discussed about PC uh, is uh, 
uh, more safe if you see pattern PRSDA mm, is mm, usually is uh, more powerful but on the other hand you need to pay attention to this uh, overfitting issue like uh, um, Q squares R squares uh, cross validation and VIP scores so um, so uh, score plot is showing up here. It is clearly better compared to uh, the PCA. The separation is better, okay? Uh, and uh, what I would like to, uh, you to pay attention is uh, uh, here on the top, they said class order matter implying time point the disease severity. So here's that uh, if you only have two groups, uh, it doesn't matter because your two groups, it's usually, um, uh, uh, always looks fine, but only you have three groups, more than two groups, and this, uh, this option going to show up. That means if you think class order matters, PSD will consider the order, try to make sure this is a time series or the concentration changes. And there's a meaning in the why. And so it will try to separate it according to uh, that uh, expected uh, it's things. It basically is doing more like a regression based but if you have multiple groups and you don't think that all the matters and you just, you need to uncheck this. And uh, why I want to emphasize this is that some people send me email and describe what they have done. Uh, basically like group A and B and C, for example, in one, five, 10 or, or one, two, three. Or, so this, what it says is they use different label they sometimes get a separation pattern different. Why? It's because, uh, because of such things. So the uh, class order things. So it's, it's a, if you are class of multiple groups and the class order does not matter, uncheck this. So, uh, so even when you change the class label, you always get the same thing. But if you class label matters, um, it, so that's, that's I, I would like to say. So if you have questions, you can ask me to clarify. Uh, the thing here is that uh, if you use different names and it will, if you use this in checked, they will order it based on the alphabetic order. So if you change the names, alphabetic order will be different. So the, uh, the pattern will be different. So this is uh, expected because if this is checked, but if this is, uh, so make, if, if your sample, multiple groups sample, class order doesn't matter. So make sure it's unchecked. So this is one issue. Sorry, I have a quick question about that topic. Yep. Um, so would that only apply to like ordinal values or like would experimental groups like matter in that case? Uh, yeah, it's uh, just all about your thinking about whether the class order, uh, for example, this time uh, in this group is matters. We uh, make it select because 0, 15, 13, and 45, that's a concentration uh, changes. We do expect that there's something uh, inherent in that uh, meaning, so we keep it. If yours, if the time series, and you probably want to skip that. So if you think this all the data give you anything more information, you just uh, uncheck it. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, for time series, uh, shouldn't we use paired uh, like type of analysis? Yeah. Uh, paired analysis only for uh, two groups, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, paired PRSDA is not available here. I, I, I can tell you, is that we do have paired t test, <laughs> so time series is not necessarily is uh, one patient before and after the treatment. And in a lot of te paired tests, it's it's actually means something different. So, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, oh, as yeah. Question on the chat. On chat? I'm not seeing the chat here. Oh, I'll read it then. It's about PCA. Uh, question regarding PCA scores plot. I have seen some people apply t tests or ANOVA to the principal component scores assigned, i.e. PC1, to each sample from different groups to identify if a separation that is visible on the scores plot is statistically significant along a principal component. What are your thoughts? And this is from Juan. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think I received that email before and uh, I'm not sure. 
so <laughs> PCA is unsupervised. It's really inherent the patterns within your data. Uh, and there's no much model assumption. Uh, it really uh, is about, uh, you can color in different ways, but you really want to see um, whether the statistics behind this one, for me is I, I found it's uh, puzzling. I, um, I don't get it, I can tell you honest, I don't get it. And uh, of course you can write a program to test it, but what, what that testing for? And I can tell you the other thing is probably more meaningful. I also received suggestions, which I, I, I'd have done before, but it's not available, is the stability of this PCA score. Sometimes PCA uh, separation is driven by one or two uh, strongly influential samples. And uh, one thing how to do this is called uh, uh, leave, uh, uh, cross validation. Basically, you leave a samples uh, one sample at a time and calculate PCA and run some at a time and uh, just uh, recalculate PCA for like the, here is like uh, uh, many times everything cross validated. So you, you can see the position change for each sample. So you're going to draw uh, a basically squiggle lines for each uh, all the possible position for the sample with regarding to their center. So they have a center, then they, then they have all this uh, variation during this cross validation. That's also, I, I found it meaningful. Basically you cross validate, you want to see the, um, the, the, the change of the position, whether it's stable or not. If you remove one or two samples, suddenly all the separation is gone, then that means uh, uh, it is not uh, so confident. But statistical testing, I'm just to tell you, be honest, I don't get it. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I just, uh, I don't understand why they want to do that because PCA is not really supposed for prediction. PCA is for looking at your own data structure. So uh, maybe whoever sent, uh, uh, sent me, want to send me if a good journal and uh, from a respected group, I would like to read more. Otherwise I, I tend to ignore that thing. I, I'm, I'm that's, I do get the suggestions to add that. I'm, I'm not convinced, so. Uh, so Jeff, it's Dave, I just, um, Mathematically, it is correct that they can do the t-test uh, if they keep things in the principal components and they can do the assessment of, of separation. So it's, it's mathematically correct. Yeah, uh, that's, that's so true, mathematically correct. It's just the statistical testing that I don't just understand what it uh, answered, except just that, that plot. It seems the statistical or significant separation. Uh, it's uh, beyond that, I just don't, Related back to uh, um, the overall big picture. So this one, at least I can say, it's not a common. So uh, uh, I will say that. But mathematical, clearly, we can do it. We can test it. That's uh, so true. I think part of the problem with PLSDA and PCA is that we can bias people's perception. So what we're showing here are colored um, ellipsoids, yeah. and if we remove the colored ellipsoids, <laughs> uh, people might not agree that there are four groups. That's true. Um, and they might not even be able to see that there are separations between at least three of the groups, clearly. Yeah. So I, I think um, there is something to be said for trying to make or provide more robust, I guess, assessment of the grouping. Because we can, we can color all we want. And, and by, by creating certain sized lipsoids, we can, we can bias a perception of clustering. And, and in the end, you want to be able to have some statistical test or some mathematical rationale to say, that's why I see four groups here rather than say three or two. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, um, yeah, one of the things we do the cross validation even for PCA and uh, I, I think uh, I got that uh, script around uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> we can plug in and allow people to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, again is that um, uh, yeah, uh, I understand all the concerns and people's frustration and especially when the signal is not um, strong and a lot of things is um, how do we get some comfort from that uh, one is statistics p-value do help so uh, but we want to make it more justifiable so I need to get that uh, um, uh, feelings and also understanding the assumption what it can tell so we can adjust in the world. So clearly I'm, 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 I'm open to a lot of these suggestions, but a lot of time is uh, we need to want to see the 
uh, a large community take on that. So, so for the PRSD cross validation, and uh, here is the default, it shows the leave one out cross validation, also plot. Uh, so why it's doing this is we want to see the, uh, uh, the what's the number of components used for the cross uh, for the for the performance. So here that we use top five, you choose one, choose two, choose three or four or five. So it seems the top three component looks um, that gives the best performance using the Q2 square, square. So this number of component is used for why is that if you use so more component, you the more component you use is more likely you're going to overfit. So uh, sorry, Jeff, Jeff, what do you mean by component? So, uh, you know, uh, PCA component one, a PCA is a principal component, right? QSDA also component. So if we want to see the PLS component one. So if you see the component, you see the component one, component two. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah. So this is we're talking about. We use that component to build the, um, to build the classification model. And uh, we use three, we use four, we use five. Basically, that's a huge matrix. And uh, here is that we plot just unit you know, component one and component two. But when we do the computing, we, we, we use, we access uh, all the um, component. But the more you use, the more likely you can go overfit. So we want to um, reduce that. Okay. So the, yeah, so the other one is that um, uh, Q2 square, sometimes you get is negative. So uh, unfortunately that happens and actually not uncommon. Uh, uh, so Q2 can be negative. So uh, people ask me question all the time. I just put a lot of answers directly below this one. So read the, this paper by, uh, that you can click to read. It's very well written and clearly in, in, in interpreted in a well, in, in a statistical well uh, sound way. So what it says is uh, when it's become negative, and it's not predictive at all or overfitted. So Q2 is negative, it means the model is overfitting, okay, not uh, well. So that's the uh, bottom line. So uh, VIP score, so VIP score is uh, well uh, promoted by, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Simca or, uh, or Simca B. So how is VIP defined? It's uh, have a good formula. So it's based on the correlation coefficient. So most time actually, you get something similar if you using either or the other one. So uh, with uh, if you use some cutoff, for example, you point one point five VIP score, you get this uh, uh, seven of them, you, or you get a top two. So it's this is uh, oh here is that you have this. Uh, yeah. So what do these different colors show? Yeah, here it shows that. Uh, so you have this um, feature that's significant. And you see, hey, this feature is significant. And um, it's a biomarker for which state. So what's the expression level? Let me say, say that, or, or what's abundance. Here it shows that uh, three PP most abundant in zero and uh, less abundant in 15 and uh, least abundant in 45. So it, uh, with more grain in the diet, three PP is reduced. And but the endotoxin actually increased. So it, it, uh, you don't have to open another uh, web page and try to see how can I interpret this result? It's significant, but how it will uh, with regard to my phenotypes. And here, the direct plot in the phenotype, the abundance level, right beside this one, so help you interpret it. Thank you. So here is uh, the permutation. So we mentioned about the PRSD overfitting and we have cross validation, but it also is not enough. So we're doing permutation. Permutation is that basically you have separation and uh, the separation uh, is uh, basically we use a, a NOVA based approach. So between uh, group versus the winning group separation. So, you know, this is a, um, uh, like a NOVA group and we use between a within and we, we, we do that. And so if uh, always between and within a, a group is a, a much la larger uh, to the right and you are safe. So again, and we, we, we agree, we, we can apply this approach to PCA. It's just, a, <laughs> just a some thinking because PCA is inherently not beautiful predictive. And uh, uh, that's if we want to do make it stable as so a permutation of cross the, the uh, the that one's cross valid the PCA is more making sense uh, at the moment, and uh, so 
So uh, here we go back to a um, more visual. Uh, so we do the PCAPRSDA, we do the um, cluster analysis. So cluster analysis is uh, uh, more visual things and uh, heat map. So cluster heat map. So we, we, um, we already discussed and the heat map actually people like it. So what, why they like it is because very comprehensive. You can get a lot of the customization and the default looks is, is good and you can get publication ready figure. So you can do it local using your R, but here is almost, a, uh, you don't have to do it uh, writing code. So here's a heat map visualization. And uh, you can see there's a lot of the distance clustering algorithm, color contrast, uh, data source, you can cluster at the uh, raw data, normalized data. You can do standard, do you want to auto scaling or not? You can do the, the new overview or detail of your detail view basically give you a huge plot. You can see more details, but it re re restrict to three, 200 features. So uh, uh, distance, you, I see it as you clean distance and the cor Pearson correlation. And uh, there's a lot of distance errors uh, commonly used. And also view mode. So you don't want to organize samples. Uh, organize because default you are going to organize the samples and the, and the features. So if you don't organize, you will order the by the class table. So it's much easier. To, you want to see the feature changes across different conditions. So we that's the thing. The other ones you want to show the cell borders, group average stuff. Uh, group average is more recent added. For example, here it shows that um, if I I only group classed in the features and with samples clustered, not clustered, just based on their sample. So you can see the some variations across different uh, uh, class labels, okay? If you may make that messed up, probably not so good for your visual detecting patterns. And uh, again, and uh, if people want to do the show the group average, it will just uh, put the average and uh, here, so it will replot everything. So sometimes people want to do that, uh, especially the replication is not so consistent. So they try to do some hiding, but anyway, I, I think that's, uh, I want to see the whole data, like the every features across all samples. Once you're doing the average and and you're not sure about the, um, whether it's the meaningful or not. So here's that uh, um, we did the uh, clustering PCA-PLSDA and uh, metabolist uh, keeping all the plots and the graphs you have generated. And uh, you can generate a printed report that summarize what you have done and what you have found. So here is that uh, one is that you can download the R history. If you, uh, you can regenerate everything from locally if you want. Also the R history actually save, save all the parameters. And uh, you can also click a general report and you're going to have a report, analysis report. So this is all your figures. But if you generate an end report, you're going to report everything in PDF and uh, save it as a PDF. So, uh, so uh, why this feature important is that because so many people are using it, we want them to capture um, and uh, parameters and reproduce the analysis. Also, uh, metabolism is actually evolving uh, gradually. So we cannot afford actually keep all the versions always there. So the best one is that we give them the best also um, yeah if they want to do it they can have a freeze uh, R package locally maybe so uh, that's uh, but uh, um, that's really we talk about something that uh, more cutting edge research edge most the core is always stable so we uh, we keep that uh, compatibility uh, in mind so here is that a correlation analysis. If you see, we, we, because we mentioned about that correlation analysis. So the, here is that you summarize who's correlated with who and with the table. And here, because you selected the last one, you selected about the average, uh, group average for heat map. It will be plotted here. And uh, you have the appendix or the R command here. So everything's ready. So everything's there and it's up to you. So uh, if you're doing a lot of analysis, it really can generate 18 or five hundred pages. So it's a lot of the things for you to read. And uh, so that's why I'm saying that we make a lot of effort to help you also help saving us time. And uh, sometimes we do get uh, um, asking uh, questions about how to interpret p-values and how to um, interpret 
box plot. So we just suggesting you, please read our tutorials, read all the stuff because uh, uh, common ones are covered. So we we we, it's not we we are mean people. It's just sometimes uh, we want to focus on something that's more cutting edge, really addressing it. For that one, we already covered. We will uh, try to refer you back to our FAQs. And uh, so um, uh, this is our command history on the right-hand side. It's always there. Every time when you're doing one command, it will plot it and update it there. And uh, this is something we have Metabolic R. It's been uh, updated quite uh, a lot. So, uh, so this is in the last month. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of updating. We refrain from committing yet because uh, we know a lot of people follow this uh, command. So if we did something is not uh, totally yet, and uh, and people will send us a lot of requests. So we try to uh, do it, release it as stable only we're testing a lot. So for you is that uh, try to install. If you have issues, you can let us know. I'm I'm not sure. Yesterday someone mentioned about this. I, I hope it's solved. Otherwise, that's um, definitely it's going to main focus. We want it to be installable on all the platforms, Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux. So the overall idea is that we want to maximize uh, uh, the use of MetaBanalyst and the knowledge that the code. And so um, um, I always see 75% of functions available in web, as to web. It's very easy to use. But for a lot of people who want to build a pipeline, especially batch analysis, it's much better to use the R, R package. If you don't care, care about the, interactive real time, you just want to hit the command line and fix the uh, parameters. Uh, it's much easier than even a uh, metabolic R package. So uh, uh, that's, we uh, finished the, um, the uh, statistics and we will start uh, going to the enrichment analysis. I think I'm, I'm still on time and uh, uh, 2.30, still have one hour. Uh, so do you have questions or I keep continue? Okay. So uh, we all talking about the um, uh, statistics and uh, from the early morning and uh, till the last slides. Now we're going to functional analysis. So, um, so the functional analysis is, uh, uh, is basically using stats, but it also consider our background knowledge, our prior knowledge. So the previously all the PCA, POSDA, universal statistics, they really purely math and does not consider uh, our prior knowledge. So we have to think hard in our mind to, hey, uh, this cluster, uh, this uh, top common, how they works. We have to connect that ourselves. So, uh, for this large omics studies, it's really not easy. And uh, we need to do it uh, using computer. How do we do that? We found out enrichment analysis really helps a lot. And, uh, and uh, the first enrichment analysis or most, uh, or at least uh, um, the gene set enrichment analysis like GSEA was uh, made it so popular, so well uh, ac accepted uh, approach to understand it a list of sequencing genes. So why it's meaningful is that a single genes, uh, first the single genes can be involved in multiple pathways or multiple processes. And it is significant, but you're not sure which, which pathways because it can involve the multi pathways. But if a group, it is more, the group behavior is more uh, pinpoint a particular pathways. So once you go to a group, and like a gene set, a pathway, it became more confident because one single gene is not like a 10 genes that uh, change together. So overall um, feeling is that uh, the gene set is a gene set or metabolite set or group or based analysis much uh, powerful, suitable for, um, for omics data. So the purpose is to test if they are biological and meaningful groups or metabolites that are significantly enriched in your data. So in order to do that, we need to define this, what's this biological meaningful groups. This is our knowledge. So when we're doing enrichment analysis itself, it's just a statistical, like a hypergeometric test. 
that's statistics. But the knowledge needs to be built in. So this is critical. So where is knowledge? Knowledge is pathways, knowledge is disease, knowledge is like a localization, which if all the components involved in, inside the mitochondria is enriched, you know something is happening uh, with mitochondria. So this knowledge needs to be captured in a text and need to be evaluated using statistics. So enrichment analysis combine our knowledge with statistics and give us the link between uh, patterns and biology. So in order to do that, uh, it's not, it, the here is not about the stats now. And uh, I, I just tell you there's a over-representation analysis, there's a single sample profile, there's quantitative enrichment analysis. It's all about the test whether this, something is enriched and it seems uh, not random. Uh, but most of our time is actually try to uh, get his knowledge collected. So uh, uh, most of this, uh, um, the knowledge is based on HMDB. And uh, so here is that um, we have a disease associated with metabolized sets. So uh, basically you have the disease and you have some sig signatures. So a few compounds change together and it's detecting blood, detecting the CSF, detecting urine. So this is a, uh, HMDB has some disease um, browser. Uh, so they do have some things that are already defined. So basically we just try to uh, collecting the samples and uh, uh, working with HMDB and get all these things more defined in a computationally, uh, computer friendly form so we can test. The other one is location based. There's uh, like a cell tissue a specific metabolites and the uh, pathway based. This is probably most uh, widely used. And uh, the other one is a single nuclear polymorphism associated metabolite set. So this is quite interesting. Why is that you have a SNP changes and uh, um, you are going to cause some phenotypes and you have some blood metabolites have signatures. So this is SNP associated metabolites. So that's meaningful. The other one is drug related pathways. So if you, we do have this, um, uh, you take the drug, you have some things in your, in your blood or urine, it will capture here. Also yesterday there's a comment about uh, uh, pesticide. And nanoparticles, some exposures. If we have a signature uh, in, in terms of the metabolites, we can capture here, and so people can test to see uh, whether it is related to. So, so uh, that's the knowledge, and here is uh, how do you upload your data? For example, over representation analysis, you basically uh, you have a list of compounds, which is significant list. How do you get that? You're doing t-test ANOVA, or you do some clustering from the compounds that are together. The other one is single assembly profiling. Single assembly profiling, you basically upload a list of compounds together with connotations. So you compare with the normal reference. So normal reference, we talk about human only. We, uh, so we know some compounds should be in certain concentration range. If you are high or low, it will become significant. And the other one is quantitative enrichment analysis. So basically you are uploading the a table. It will do some quantitative enrichment analysis and uh, within them and find the significant uh, genes and doing enrichment analysis. So QG, QG is uh, probably more powerful because uh, um, metabolists have built in approach and make it more suitable. Sometimes you do your own statistical analysis, not necessarily give the best one. So once you get a metabolite set library and we'll do the enriched analysis to have, you are going to see the enriched pathways. So we already discussed, you can upload a list, you can upload a list of compounds together with concentrations and all you want to upload are concentration tables. Again, this is all uh, targeted metabolomics. So untargeted, uh, we'll talk about it uh, uh, later in the uh, uh, called mommy chalk. So, so here is that you upload compound list, you copy and paste. So this is a compound name and uh, it will just uh, uh, upload and try to recognize. So one of the issues that a compound name is, uh, is that could be a uh, typo. For example here, isoleucine, so L-E-U. And here's a missing U. So we'll try to uh, I'll let you to see how uh, uh, maybe you mean isoleucine, and uh, we'll ask you to correct it. So this is, if you're using HMDB ID, or um, some public ID is easier. So, but a lot of people find the uh, common name is more useful. 
So if you uh, uh, standardize your names and you do this uh, select library, so this library is here and you select which pathway you are interested in or disease associated set or urine or CSF associated metabolite set. So there's a um, different organization to help you uh, select. And uh, here is that uh, um, you get a result. Result shows that as either a network or as this one more traditional. So network basically means that uh, each set is not a totally independent, okay? Each set share the metabolites with other ones. So, uh, so that also gives you some, some feelings about whether certain, uh, whether it is a uh, melanin or it is a uh, glycine and serum. So if they both significant, but uh, they share the same core metabolites. So it's probably, it's hard to tell one from the other. So it's really, uh, it, it complements this one because this one just seems every pathway is uh, isolated, independent, but it's uh, connected. So it uh, really help you to understand how complex, how correlated they are. So it, below it will be a table and uh, you see this one ranked by the genes and here you click view, I think. Uh, this one, you see uh, this is alanine metabolism. You have two significant things, two significant match. So this is not very convincing because there's uh, so many compounds, you only have two match. So hopefully you have more matches, more common you will be. And also you can click SMPDB and because this one is really uh, just to show you a name and you want to see it, you want to see it from here, alanine metabolism. You can see a lot of the text and uh, you see where it's located to build your story. So here's simple summer profiling. And, um, and you see what you need to do is that you have a um, uh, concentrations. So when you have concentrations, you will go into compare with the reference. So uh, the reference is based on HMDB. So, and you can see that uh, uh, when you compare, you have mean, uh, uh, high, and uh, I think the other one's low. So basically uh, M is the median. So you are within uh, the range. So high is above the range. So for example, here is the high and here is several high and you can, uh, you can include these high ones. Sometimes even you see the medium ones, you find it's, it's, not, it's very marginal. I want to include it, you can click to select. So the one with high and here showed here, you want to do the statistic enrichment analysis, you include them. So for this one, you can only put in for a single sample since you need concentrations? Yeah, so you need to marry it uh, and with the sample. So that you marry all the samples, you copy and paste here, and you are going to compare with the reference uh, as a, a found out from the literature. And uh, so for example, here in this L training, what you married is 39.19. <clears throat> and here labeled nine. Uh, labeled high and you, you see, and you want to click a view. So click a view and see this. This is what you measured, 39.19. This is here. And uh, how many strandium be married? And uh, uh, this is all reported on literature. It's the PubMed. Uh, this is 136.2, 12 point the study two, one, two, three. So there were 10 studies, okay? They, they reported about the measurement, the range, it's all here. It's your range, so it's pretty confident. Either you you uh, somehow <clears throat> uh, something wrong with the patient, or could be the sample is no more concentrated because all the ten studies now of them get that high value. So it's just a sanity check. So um, that this one is more on the real data sample. You data tables, so you have this. Uh, uh, whole concentration matrix, okay? And uh, you just click through, it will give you uh, data normalization, missing value imputation, and uh, enrichment analysis. And uh, you can click a node to see uh, analysis or suit more. So what I'm saying that uh, it is more powerful, uh, the algorithm. So you have a lot of the things lights up. So uh, you can click one, but here is that uh, you not only see the matched names, you also see the box plot, box plot, because you see the, because it's uploading as a concentration table, you actually see their uh, concentration range, so you can get a box plot. Uh, this is a 
cancer, cachexic and control, and they have three, three match, and they seem to all considered higher in the cachexic versus uh, control. So, and uh, that's uh, enrichment analysis. So enrichment analysis is really testing your set. This set is uh, just a, a text you put, uh, you, you just put it there. You don't have a structure, okay? So uh, you don't know who's inter interact, who who is turned on first, who is second. You don't know that. You just know they changed together as a signature. So pathway analysis is more refined. So, uh, so because pathway actually contains then more knowledge. So, so we uh, support in a structure and a visualization and help you see who's upstream, who's downstream. And uh, currently supporting 21, I'm, I'm thinking about PROG 23 now, uh, we are gradually adding some uh, 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 organisms and mainly model species. So if we click pathway analysis and we click using example data, we just go through it. And this is again, this is a cancer uh, MR data and we use, uh, uh, this is a lung cancer. And here we choose auto scaling and uh, just for demonstration, okay, and uh, purpose. And we use a default parameter like a, a global test. And uh, um, uh, with the CAG, we, because the pathway analysis we mainly use in CAG, we also have the HMDB, uh, SMPDB, but a lot of the library actually based on the CAG. Why is that uh, uh, CAG have a long tradition also passing CAG and uh, uh, rendering, rendering with uh, rendering, it seems quite well established a lot of our packages. So uh, uh, here is that, uh, how do we do the pathway analysis? So one thing is the enrichment analysis we already used for the metabolite setting enrichment analysis. The other one is that uh, we want to do um, topology analysis. So this is new. So uh, uh, topology analysis, what topology means? So within a pathway or within a network, we want to see something that uh, seems more significant, more important. So what's that, uh, what's, uh, which position more important here is that uh, hub. So nodes that have a high, that are highly connected. So if this node changes, it probably have a more effect rather than the, uh, that leaf, that edge. So the other one is bottlenecks that blue nodes. So if this node changes, it has a lot of effect on the other one. So um, this one can be actually catch, captured easily with degree centrality. So red is very high degree and blue is very high um, between its centrality. So this is one is, uh, there's more, probably slightly more advanced to help you to select the nodes that are more important. Uh, what it says is uh, um, for the metabolites that are changed, if they are more in a significant uh, position or important position, it's more likely have an impact on the pathway than those that are on the very downstream at the lowest level. So because uh, of direction, if you change here, you don't have impact on the upstream. So they usually, it's uh, thinking that way. So we use this intuitive uh, uh, reasoning. We just incorporated this one and uh, so uh, basically what we want to see is that a fold change of diff different uh, metabolites and, uh, and we use them to also consider topology. If they are topology or significant, then we combine them to uh, visualize them, okay? So, um, so the thing that we, so, uh, we just uh, put this um, impact as a uh, axis. So you can see the same thing and the more to the right, to the right, it became more um, have more impact. Basically, those changes more in a, a important position. And uh, on the p value, a y value is that the the smaller the p value is more significant. So this is in rich analysis. So what we re really want is that we have more uh, pathways that with metabolite changes that are significant and also on the central. Uh, top good, uh, important location. For example, if you see this, this is screen, you see this, this is you click, it's a glycine, serine, and threonine metabolism. And you click this, you will see the pathway like uh, this. And you will see that a lot of the uh, changes actually in the upstream 
all in the center because you see this, this is connected to so many other things. So if you change on upstream here with a lot of connection, this is between a centrality, a degree centrality very high. So uh, something else give the same p-value, but only probably in the downstream. So what I'm saying is if you want to see where the pathway enriched, so you need to uh, impact it, you need to think about the structure rather than just by the p-value alone. I have a quick question about that. Sure. How do you uh, like quantify that pathway impact? Because it's obviously it's numerical here. So yeah, you so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you well, you can see the R code to how do you do that. So okay. <laughs> I know. No, I'm just giving us. So there's a, some something is that uh, you you know um, uh, each pathway and uh, each uh, within a pathway you can have a, a node actually have a degree, right? You do have a degree calculation based on how they connect it. And you normalize the two um, uh, to a total as one. For example, you can see this um, pathway okay. is, is, is not absolute degree, it's normalized by the total. And so the maximum impact you can get is probably one. And uh, so if you have this one, have this uh, impact, normalized impact uh, degree of value, and plus this one, plus this one. So you, you can edit them up. So eventually, the if the more important, the uh, this, so you will add it up more. So, so let's see. So, so the root of my question is really, um, is something that has, for example, a lot of downstream um, impacts going to, going to look different than something that has like, for example, just like three downstream players. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. those, the, would those be weighted differently? Yeah. So this one considered direction. Okay, definitely upstream. Only considered from up to down. Okay, don't consider. Yeah. It. So it considered direction. And uh, let me see. Uh, uh, relatively between this alt degree. So uh, so if you. Uh, so what what it says is um, uh, this is a probably called alt degree. And uh, from here you don't have receive a degree. This basically except this one. If you have uh, this, it's probably zero. So you even your impact you. If you even changes, it does not contribute to this impact. So only changes to this will be added. So, okay. Yeah, this this is not a, hard, a rocket science. We just do a lot of the uh, normalization, make sure it's compatible, and uh, also think that upstream uh, should have higher impact than downstream. And uh, so they add it up together. Whether there's a better ways, and I do believe it could be. But I'm not uh, quite aware. Also, there's need some benchmarking. What's how do we interpret and proportional? For example, here and here, definitely we all agree. But here, probably you don't want to see that. So clearly, uh, the uh, algorithm reflects in this. Okay, if you change it here and change it here, even you have the same number of metabolites or uh, or more, probably if you are going to hide it here, so you will be significant equally, but not going to be on this side. Thank you. And so uh, <clears throat> here also give you some stats and uh, you total 32, you have eight matched. So this is more confident. So this is uh, something uh, you click, you see that and you see that um, again, we capture everything. So you get this uh, figures, you get this uh, report and uh, we do biomarker analysis now. So uh, let's keep going. So we talked about this morning about uh, classification uh, we see the accuracy um, error rate, which is fine, but it's not biomark analysis. Biomark analysis is actually quite different. It is talking about sensitivity, specificity, and ROC, AUC. That's more meaningful in clinic. So that's why at the beginning I said, why people don't use some machine learning method? And we realized that uh, it's not that uh, straightforward. <clears throat> So, uh, uh, because we want need to consider this uh, sensitivity specificity, and uh, um, and uh, we also need to respect the, the tradition. So, tradition is that the clinicians they use uh, uh, univariate or just single biomarker at a time, and the more modern thing uh, approach is using multivariate analysis. So, basically, we can use a random forest using um, 
uh, SVM using pure SDA, we can do that, no problem. And uh, a lot of time people want to do it manually. Why? Uh, I believe these three metabolites are most important. I want to manually select them. So uh, this is um, three different modes. So you can do everything. You can do univariate or whatever you want. You can do multivariate using the machine automatically select, or you can manually select. So you go to a biomarker, you select uh, like, let's see this first uh, uh, data set. And again, this is uh, uh, this uh, eclipse here. So it's a, preg a pregnant uh, mother's and uh, it's from serum. So 45 is uh, pre eclampsia here and uh, 45 is a normal pregnancy and try to find biomarkers for pre eclampsia here. That's the goal. So uh, the, all the data pre-processing similar. So you can see uh, we don't have, we only have five missing values. And uh, so it's fine, let's skip. And uh, here, if we want to go, we click on log normalization and we want to be as uh, simple as possible. Why is that uh, you can, you recall one question about, uh, if you build biomarker models, you do a lot of data processing, you change the scale. So yes, we, we are aware of that. We hope not to touch the raw values, but on the other hand, we have to, because it's just the uh, downstream machine learning or statistics expect that. But we will also want to use simple approach as possible. While we are on this page, this slide is something new here. It's on the top. <clears throat> And let me see the next one, or oh, you didn't see it. So on the top is that uh, compute and include uh, metabolite ratios. So uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a well agreed uh, uh, observation or uh, actually conceptually people already suspect that is um, metabolite itself not may not be as predictive as metabolite ratio because uh, uh, it's flux. So metabolite um, product or reactant uh, so their ratio is more pronounced than the metabolite itself. So it's a lot of time it turned out to be true. So um, especially for biomarker analysis, people really, really want to try their best to improve the performance. And they do find that using a ratio, sometimes um, the performance, the ratio biomarker and performance sometimes is better than using original concentration. So we do allow you to include in this uh, ratio. But on the other hand, I will give you is that ratio uh, you, you, you include in um, original metabolites, also including a ratio, you can significantly improve, in, increase the size of the features and increase the um, overfitting risk. And uh, so also, even even you're doing it here, you're already including your risk already. So a potential overfitting issue associated with the procedure. So whatever you are doing, if you're doing this, you need to validate it on an independent cohort. Okay, this is uh, the other one. So you should have another validation set. Never use it for cross validation. So if you're doing this, it will increase your chance of develop discover biomarkers. But whether the performance here is a real is realistic or not, most likely not. So you need to validate it on a brand new cohort. This is what I would like to see. And let's move on to the log normalization. <clears throat> uh, we didn't use a ratio, okay? Here, that's a different story. We just use the simple ones and want to explain how it works. So we do a normalization and it seems auto scan uh, log it looks very well after. So we don't do the classical, we're just doing multivariate RC curve. And uh, here we do the uh, default is linear SVM and SVM built in, so classification. So <clears throat> uh, in order to build the RC curve, it's especially a very smooth RC curve. And uh, uh, we need to do a lot of the, you need to get a bootstrapped, bootstrapped sample. So that means uh, we do a lot of the, oh, you need to, uh, a lot of samples uh, to get a smooth things. So what we have tried to do is called the MCCCV, it's a Monte Carlo cross-validation using balanced subsampling. So we're just uh, uh, doing a subsampling and uh, using two third uh, uh, to, to do the training and one third to do the left out. So the details of this is uh, described here. So 
and um, mm, also the R code is all available. So we try to be clean, try to be efficient, and also try to be um, don't susceptible to the imbalance sample. For example, uh, biomarker. Even we try to do that, sometimes uh, people give samples only have a few cases. The majority is controlled, so it will affect in your uh, cutoff. So we do here is a balanced subsampling. So make sure every subsampling is have the equal number of cases and control. So then in that case, we have a clear cutoff is at the 0.05. So we can easily do that. So for example, here uh, we uh, uh, see the example uh, using SVM and, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, compare all the models. So we uh, we use a significant we so so here is that um, uh, uh, I need to mention user need to specify the class we can method and the feature ranking method and uh, this is a w one thing we uh, we need uh, for SVM. There's a linear SVM. There's a built in, and also for this uh, for this uh, uh, algorithm and. Uh, we do the subsampling. We also do the feature ranking. Why is that we want to use a subset of features to build the biomark models? We don't want to use all features because the more features you use, the more susceptible to overfitting. So if you can find the two biomarkers and predict very well, it's much easier to develop in clinical. So, so the feature selection and the cross validation is built in. Okay. And so this is a one challenge of a lot of the uh, um, omics based biomarker discoveries is that if you use all biomarkers, it's overfitting. If you choose a few biomarkers, and you also need to be very careful about the cross validation because you don't want to um, select your features based on all samples, then you see classification is so good, which is clearly overfitting. You cannot do that. So. And the feature selection cross validation had to be all happen within each fold within each uh, cross validation not use the so it cannot be separated so this one is uh, uh, i want to just make sure uh, if you're interested in uh, doing this okay. biomarker discovery this uh, um, jeff i have a quick question so it's like uh, the first question is how many feature you consider here and the second like did you adopt any feature reduction technique in order to avoid the overfitting and improve the model performance so we don't know how many features uh, we we will find the best so we just uh, select a further example of two three five ten uh, hundred so basically you just uh, create a ladder and just uh, rank, uh, using your pre-ranked uh, features, you just uh, select and see whether uh, at like, for example, two, three, five, uh, hopefully uh, some simple model actually perform better. The thing is that if you se select more features, not necessarily you're going to be better because overfitting things, that's a, a cross validation will tell you you are overfitting. That's exactly, mm, I want to tell you is that, uh, um, uh, so uh, I'm not sure. So the bottom uh, part is, uh, is already cut off. So you can see uh, just be below is uh, there's some ranking on the models, two, three, five, or different things. So top performing model, not necessarily is the one with the most number of features. So two or three probably give you the best. Cross validation do tell you your feature using 100 features actually not working well. Um, so, Yep. Jeff, sorry, uh, does that have a risk for the uh, information leakage if we select the most uh, important uh, feature to predict the model? Yeah, this is one I just mentioned about. Uh, you have to do the feature selection within each fold. Not You cannot do the selection using the whole data. So uh, so if you select uh, the feature within that two-third, okay? Yeah, okay. And uh, use that feature to predict the one third that doesn't use the further significant features. Then that will you're not going to leak. So uh, I will going to address that uh, uh, issue. So this is the only way, only best way to address that. And but it will cause some issues if your feature is not stable, which will come, probably come up in next few slides. So. Here it shows that the model four is probably the best. And um, so this model four have 10 features. 
And when you select one models, you can actually see the confidence interval, which is people want to see as from uh, 0.9 to 1, it's 95 interval, so it's common. So here it's exactly addressing the questions that you mentioned about uh, <clears throat> feature. So first is that we do the feature selection only within each fold. Like we use two thirds of this subsample the things, select sample, then predict another uh, fold. It's not, not used for feature selection. Then we do another two third uh, uh, to do the feature selection and predict another one not used for feature selection. So this whole thing is subsampling and the prediction and it's kind of repeat for as many as possible because we are doing Monte Carlo. But the issue here is that uh, we don't get a consistently significant feature in each fold. They are going to change. So for, uh, for example, one to third, you probably find the gl uh, glycerol is uh, top. In another one, probably it's the rank the third one. So if you choose the top three, and it's, it's not stable. So if it's stable, it might make life easy, but a lot of time it's not. So in the end, it's how do you know your feature mm, is most meaningful? Uh, the only thing is that the, uh, the things we found is uh, rank a feature by the frequency of being selected. So because uh, if you select uh, the features in the model and you just select it and select it how many times, this is um, meaningful but uh, the rank is not because uh, that's, that's instability because uh, mm, especially you have smaller data set, you don't really get that. Sometimes people find, find everything is, uh, 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 this data set give you more or less a rank. A lot of time you have this uh, almost a fl uh, straight line, so they don't have too much variations. So, uh, so far that uh, um, uh, enrichment analysis, pathway analysis, mainly for the uh, uh, targeted metabolomics and the biomarker uh, and the statistical, basically that's almost uh, uh, orthogonal. So you can do a uh, target on target, okay? And uh, here is another new, um, new uh, module called MS Peaks to Pathways. This one's for untargeted. So the motivation for this is that uh, uh, people have to spend a lot of time to identify the compounds and uh, to do functional analysis. But uh, they spend a lot of time and then do the functional analysis and find out they are not uh, significantly changed. So there's a lot of time has been wasted if you know uh, um, these compounds is more likely to be involved in, in a certain functions and change the significant. So before we talk about untargeted metabolomics, it is you uh, doing a statistical analysis on the, on the features and to try to identify those significant features, which is fine, but a lot of time these features, you cannot identify which, mm, there's no compounds as, as, as assigned to these uh, peaks. And uh, yeah, there's no spec, there's no pathways involved. So you get it, you cannot explain them. How do we want to do that? Is uh, we want to do some uh, enrichment analysis first. Then we want to re try to identify these uh, compounds involved in these functions. So you, you see the features identified from this enriched pathways already know the most likely uh, the compounds is within these pathways. So you only need to focus the compound within these pathways. And, uh, it is interpretable and functionally meaningful. And uh, this is uh, something, uh, how this whole story has come here. <clears throat> we already mentioned about uh, accurate annotation of the feature is very time consuming because you need to do the reference standard, you need to do MSMS. And uh, it takes about days to months. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, you don't have to, because uh, if you're looking at the group level, like uh, the whole pathway level. And the uh, statistic can help you a lot to uh, reduce the uncertainty. So how do we do that? Is that uh, we borrow this uh, thinking from GSEA. GSEA, we already mentioned in rich analysis. You're looking at the group behavior. So an uh, individual can be random, but when you have a group consistent pattern, it's more confident. How do you see the significance? 
well, we do permutation. So uh, I already mentioned about the permutation. So GSC is a permutation um, approach, which takes some time, but uh, nowadays they get much, much faster when we understand how it uh, behaves. So we do a GSC almost immediate. And we also do the GSC for um, this mummy chalk also very fast. <clears throat> so the key idea is to leverage the power of the order inherent in the biological system to tolerate random errors inaccuracies in individual peak assignment. So the important here is the error must be random. So if it's random and we see consistency, now we know there's some patterns here. So we all we need to test whether this order is significant or not. So the chance of seeing an order from a group is very low. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, making the group-based uh, functional analysis without accurate identification at the individual feature level. It's very uh, making sense. So LCM and PICS, so you can upload your PICS list and basically you do your PIC, line, uh, PIC and level analysis, whatever uh, in your favorite tools, or you can do it with a metabolic analyst. Then you copy and paste this ranked PIC list. So whole PIC can be ranked based on p-values, based on t-score. So uh, I uh, recommend you always use two group analysis, don't use multi-groups. And uh, so, because it's easy to interpret. So that's the way. So again, you can have so many different format, one column, two column, three column, because you want p-value and t-score. And it, mm, so we have a lot of examples. So you're welcome to try and think about uh, which one is most suitable. And uh, also, if you don't you know, want to do it, you can upload a peak intensity table. So, uh, <clears throat> Here is uh, um, two algorithms. We use MamiChalk and GSC. So uh, MamiChalk is e e e designed for metabolomics. GSC is we just adapt from uh, uh, MS uh, from the gene setting rich analysis. We find both is, is helpful. So we provide both. And here's some other thing that's called uh, ADACT uh, currency comp metabolites. So uh, this one will help you improve uh, the ADEX or, or a currency common re improve the um, annotation. So it will usually refine the result a slight bit. The default, we do a lot of default based on the best practice, but some people are really expert. They can improve it. We allow them to do it there. So we have a lot of the uh, uh, pre-built in uh, pathways. And um, so it uh, updated last year. So here is a M. Um, I believe this is a GSE. If you GSE, because this is uh, uploaded the pathways, uh, downloaded the up, regulated up, down regulated. You can uh, actually click to see how many of them hits, and so it's. Um, and you go to next level. You see the pathways overlaid on this CAG pathways, and you. This is basically you select a lot of pathways. You highlight here, and you click individual the the matched uh, compounds. You will see how many matches here. It's uh, uh, all these different addicts and you will see whether it's meaningful or not. So here is that you don't know, but um, uh, you know the function is more, more trustworthy. And you click into your compound, you see who's assigned to the compound. You will see, huh, this compound being so many of this uh, potential hits more likely to be true. And especially, especially in uh, um, uh, places that a lot of uh, Compounds concentrated in particular regions followed in a particular pathway, and here and here, and more probably give you some confidence that activity there is turned on. So, if you want to do some validation, you should focus on the compound that, uh, that's um, there to your to pathways. <clears throat> so, uh, that is mummy chalk uh, using the statistical test. And the, the other thing is that. Uh, we don't want to do the global uh, t-test, uh, rank them. We just want to see what is the patterns um, within my data. For example, I think this is an immune cell, probably a dendritic cell, and it's uh, been treated in the different uh, uh, antigens maybe. I forgot uh, the whole context. So it caused different uh, uh, Play different changes. So, uh, and then, uh, for example, here, um, if you, you upload, uh, if you upload uh, uh, peak intensity tables, you will see the 
uh, this one, heat map. So this one's interactive heat map. So what it will show is that there's a lot of the places or patterns seem interesting. For example, here you can drag, use your mouse drag and stop. You will see like this one right in the middle of here. So this is your point of region of interest. And you think here the peaks actually change a lot with regarding to the experimental conditions. And you want to see whether there's certain function enriched. So this is, a, and you do uh, enrich analysis on this region, okay? So you are not doing a global ranking in the p-values. You are using your eyes to select the region of interest and the testing the weather certain things. Now you can see that uh, there's a CoA biosynthesis, your failure anion metabolism, and uh, you can label them with different colors. And you can see how many of the hits are there. So it's all uh, labeled, you can see you click, see again, see some different uh, um, adducts on the right. So it complements the statistical test, allow you to visually select the regions and do an enriched analysis. And you can design your MS, MS later on that. So again, uh, we cover about half of the functions within our tools and uh, still a lot more to, to cover. And clearly, I think that's uh, almost uh, your turn, or we still have more time, I'm not sure. <laughs>